Dear community, it is a pleasure to be part of the first virtual conference of the EDS Society. My name is Ines Kapferer. I'm from the Medical University of Innsbruck. This is in the Alps, in the Austrian Alps, and we are a very small town. We have 130,000 inhabitants and 30,000 are students, so we are a very small but a very lively town. And we have the steepest ski slope of Europe. It is just up there in the mountains. So maybe you come to Innsbruck once and uh, go down from the ski slope. Uh, my personal story with Ehlers Danlos syndromes began in 2012 with this young lady. She was 24 years old at this time. And to be honest, uh, in 2012, I knew more or less nothing about Ehlers Danlos syndromes. I even did not know that there is more than one Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So this lady presented and she said, I lose my teeth. And I thought, wow, she has really severe periodontitis. And then she said, also my sister loses her teeth. She is 28 years old. Uh, and then she said, oh, and my mother lost all her teeth when she was 35. So I thought, wow, I have found a new trait of aggressive periodontitis or something like that. And it took me one and a half year to recognize that this is periodontal Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Uh, at that time, the genetic cause of periodontal Ehlers Danlos syndrome was unknown. We started a genetic study and in 2016, uh, our group was able to publish the genetic cause of periodontal Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So this is my story with EDS. But what is periodontitis? And why do you lose lo your teeth with periodontitis? You can see here a tooth, a healthy tooth, and you can see the crown, and you can see the root, and you can see that the tooth supporting bone goes nearly up to the crown. Also in a healthy condition, you always have a mild immune reaction in the gums because you always have some bacteria in your mouth. But with periodontitis, you have a very severe inflammatory bone loss. So the tooth supporting bone is lost. It is destructed by the inflammation. And finally, the tooth gets loose and it falls out. This is periodontitis. Periodontitis is very common. Um, approximately 70% of the adult population have periodontitis, but usually it is mild or slowly progressing and it starts with the age of 40 and yes, so this is normal periodontitis. With periodontal Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it is rapidly progressing. It starts very early, it starts at the mean age of 12 years and it progresses so rapidly that most of the patients have a complete tooth loss at the age of 20 years. So this is the major manifestation of periodontal ehlers danlos syndrome. There is a second manifestation. This are these pretibial discolorations. And these discolorations have been hematomas which don't resolve. For example, this lady, she was hit by a snowball and this was a hematoma and it never resolved. So this will stay for the whole life. This is the second main manifestation of periodontal EDS. And then you have a specific gum phenotype. This is, these are very thin gums. I will explain this in my next slide. You can see here uh, children whose parents are affected by periodontal EDS. And in the upper row, you see healthy children and they have very thick gums. They have a band of very thick gingiva. We call this gingiva. 
And then here comes the thin mucosa. And also here you can see the thick gingiva and also here. And the children who are affected with periodontal EDS, they have very thin gums. You can also see the blood vessels. So thin are these gums. And this phenotype is so specific that you can say with a photograph whether a child is affected or not. So periodontitis is the main manifestation of periodontal EDS. But it is also claimed again and again that also other types of EDS are associated with a higher risk of periodontitis. And a few years ago, I wondered whether this is right because, you know, I have never seen a patient with classical or vascular EDS who had severe periodontitis. And I started to do a systematic review. A systematic review is a review where you collect every paper which has been written up to now about this topic. So we collected all the papers on EDS and periodontal disease. And then we, we read them and um, we found that there was not a single publication who could prove that other types of EDS are associated with a higher risk of periodontitis. So what I can say to you today is that early severe periodontitis is a feature of periodontal EDS, but not of other EDS types. So if you have classical or hypermobile or vascular EDS or any other type, um, you don't have a higher risk for periodontitis. I mean, you just you know, you can get normal periodontitis as anybody else, but you're not at a higher risk. So I think this is important to know. What we have seen with classical EDS is that some teeth have no roots. This has been described in nine individuals. This is also not a lot, but um, I can't tell you how often this happens because we don't have clinical studies, but these teeth fall out. So if there is a tooth without a root, this tooth falls out. He has not periodontitis, but he falls out. But we don't know the true prevalence about this symptom. What we know is that um, all types of EDS are associated with pulp stones. Pulp stones are calcifications of the dental nerve. You can see this here. This black or gray structure is the dental nerve. And inside you can see stones. These are pulp stones. They they are not really a problem, so you can't feel them and they don't hurt. But if you need a root canal treatment, the treatment is a little bit more complicated with these stones. It is possible to do a root canal treatment, but it is a little bit more work and more difficult. There have been described other manifestations with EDS. For example, supernumerary teeth or rotated teeth or tooth transpositions. Tooth transpositions means that two teeth change their position. So the canine is in the position of the premolar and the premolar is in the position of the canine. But these are only single case reports, but so we don't know whether this is just a coincidence because also people without EDS may have supernumerary teeth or rotated teeth or tooth transpositions. So we don't know whether these are really manifestations of EDS or it was just a coincidental finding in these patients. What is of great significance to all people with EDS is that there seems to be a resistance to local anesthetics. There is a very nice study, which was published last year in 2019. And maybe some of you um, took part on this study. 
the authors sent questionnaires to 980 people with EDS and 249 people without EDS. And they just asked them, have you ever had a problem with a local anesthetic injection not working adequately or properly? And what they found is that indeed 88% of the EDS respondents recalled inadequate pain prevention and only 33 of the non-EDS respondents recalled inadequate pain prevention. So there seems to be a resistance to local anesthetics in the EDS, but we don't know why. The authors were so clever <laughs> that they also asked which agents were successful and they found that articaine was successful in people with EDS. Articaine is a very common agent and also bupivacaine and mepivacaine were successful. But um, the bupivacaine and mepivacaine, they have a disadvantage that they have a very long lasting effect. So the anesthetic effect lasts for eight hours. So this is also not good. So you should prefer articaine. The last topic of my presentation are dental implants. Dental implants are titanium or ceramic screws uh, which replace natural teeth. So when you have lost a tooth, you can replace it with a dental implant. And you can see here a healthy dental implant and it is covered up to the top by the bone, the implant supporting bone. With peri-implantitis, the implant supporting bone is lost. This is similar to periodontitis. And you can see now that the two, uh, sorry, the implant supporting bone is lost and the implant gets loose and finally it falls out. And what our group found is that people with periodontal EDS have a very high risk to get peri-implantitis. So these people not only lose their teeth, they also lose the dental implants. And this is a big issue because uh, implant supported prosthetic solution is very expensive. For example, this lady, she paid approximately 10,000 euros for this prosthetic solution. And we had to take it out five years later. So um, yes, this is a big problem. But for the others, I can tell that there does not seem to be an increased risk for implant loss with other EDS types. Again, the scientific evidence is not that good. We only have one study on five individuals with hypermobile or classical EDS. But these five individuals had no problems with the implants. So in conclusion, we know that all types of EDS have a higher resistance to local anesthetics. We have good evidence for periodontal EDS that it is associated with early and severe periodontitis. We have specific gums, we have pulp stones, and an increased risk for peri-implantitis. But for the other EDS types, there is a striking lack of evidence. We know for vascular EDS that there might be exceeding roots. It's, this means that the tooth roots may be a little bit longer than with other teeth. But um, yes, that's all what we know and this is not a lot. That's why we decided to make a clinical study on the oral manifestations of various EDS types. We have planned to do this study next year together with um, the NHS in London and in Sheffield with the ehlers danlos Syndrome NHS Diagnostic Service and together with the Medical University of Vienna and the Medical University of Münster, which is, which is in Germany. And we want to look at periodontal disease, enamel defects, temporomandibular joint, dental anesthetics, implant success and root deformities. 
and hopefully I can tell you more in three or four years. So if you think now, um, wow, I would like to help uh, to get more evidence on dental manifestations, you can write me an email and um, we contact you next year and maybe you can provide us a dental x-ray or you can answer questionnaire to help us to get more evidence on the dental manifestations of EDS. I want to conclude with the practical advice, which is important for all of you. Bleeding gums are not normal. Bleeding gums are always a sign of inflammation. And what you can do is brush your teeth in the, in the right way. And how to brush your teeth in the right way. It is good to use interdental brushes. You also can use dental floss, but interdental brushes are much, much easier and more efficient to use. So I recommend to use interdental brushes. You can use an electric toothbrush or a manual toothbrush. Um, it doesn't matter what you want to use. There was an interesting study published last year and they looked at 100 individuals how they brushed and why they were efficient with toothbrushing. And what the authors have seen is that it does not matter which brush you use. It does not matter how long you brush. It does not matter which toothpaste you use. It's all about systematics. This means what is important is that you always start with the same tooth and that you brush one tooth after the other. For example, you start with the lower molar at the right side and then you brush the last molar for five seconds, the first molar, then the premolars, then the canine, then the incisors and then you go to the left side and then you brush the canine, the premolars, the molars, all from the lingual aspect and then you go to the buccal aspect and now you brush again the molars, the premolars, the teeth in the front and then the other teeth and then you go to the up. So this is the most important thing I can tell you today for your teeth. Thank you.